Okay, Lynn, Moana opening soon for Disney. I'm sure you grew up as a Disney fan, an animation fan. What, what was it like getting that call that they wanted you to work on their movie? Uh, pretty thrilling. Uh, you know, the, the, the Disney movie that first transported me was The Little Mermaid. Uh, I saw that movie right when I needed to. Uh, it came out when I was nine years old. And I remember, you know, Sebastian the Crab breaking into a Calypso number in the middle of this Disney movie. And, and my life has never been the same since. Um, so to get to work with the directors of that film, uh, which was so huge in my life, uh, Ron and John, uh, and, and contribute music uh, to this world was, was really a dream come true. How long ago did they contact you? Um, two years and seven months ago. And I know that because I got the call to work on this movie the same week we found out uh, we were having a baby. Uh, so we were... Um, my wife was five weeks along, and uh, and then and my son turned two yesterday. So it's uh, you know I, I can measure his life uh, in our journey in creating Moana's story. So he's going to have plenty of Moana and Maui toys. Yes, he does, and he 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 knew the songs ahead of everybody. <laughs> what goes into just crafting a song for for an animated movie where you've got to serve the story, you've got to serve all of these producers, the directors, uh, everybody else. Yeah, I think the thing that makes it, uh, one, it's the same skill set as, as writing music for the theater. Um, you're telling a story, you're getting from point A to point B, um, and you're hopefully being as entertaining as possible along the way. Um, I think the added um, really fun challenge of this was, um, I was hyper aware, and I think we were all hyper aware, that we're representing a part of the world that isn't represented on screen very much. You know, the, the culture and the musical heritage of, of the Pacific Islands. And so we wanted to honor that and be true to it. Um, and we had great fortune in that my, my co-writer, Opatai Fowai, uh, is an amazing musical ambassador for that part of the world. Um, so you want to get those details right. You want to get the rhythms right, the orchestration, um, you know, the things that if you get those details right, you know, that part of the world sees themselves well reflected. Uh, and then there's the greater story challenges, um, which is the fun part. You know, it's not just collaborating. If I'm writing a musical, I'm collaborating with my director and my music director and my choreographer. That's sort of the brain trust. Um, multiply that by 100 when you're working on an animated film and there's animators and storyboard artists and designers. Um, so what was really fun, my favorite part of the whole process were the, these off-site meetings where uh, everyone's sitting around the room and everyone in the room is working on either your film or another film in the Disney pipeline. So you're getting notes, not from studio execs where you have no idea what their qualifications are to be in the room. You're, that's the director of Frozen, that's the director of Inside Out, that's the director of Big Hero 6, and they're kicking the tires. On your work and and giving you notes and giving you uh, their feedback and so um, I sort of you know my tiny role in this was sort of being the ambassador for the music team of what I felt music could cover you know those three scenes you're talking about that I can do that in a verse and a chorus um, and so that was that was the fun of the process is sort of um, you know the musical moments in this film uh, feeling fluid and organic and also um, you know getting us from point A to point B, not feeling like slobbed in, like, oh, here's a montage and here's a song to slap on the montage, um, but really uh, being integral to the storytelling of the film. And John Lasseter, is he, is he heavily involved in every production? Yeah, John Lasseter sits at the, you know, it's, it, it's, the seats are in a circle, so no one's at the head of it. Um, but I, I don't know if there is a better person in terms of uh, hashing out story than John Lasseter in the world. Um, you know, he, he really is, um, and, and, and the thing he, he has that is so special is, is what I've seen in a lot of great producers, but he's got it in particular. He's not trying to give you notes to make his version of the movie. Um, I remember after one of the really early screenings, um, he said, Ron and John, I remember how excited you were when you came back from your first trip to the Pacific Islands and how touched you were by the culture and the people you'd met there. Um, and this film has to honor them. And, you know, the movie is here and I want to get it to that place. Um, I, I want to get it to that feeling you had when you, when you came back from that trip. Um, and we start there and we start 
chasing artistic impulses. Um, and we hash and sweat every detail um, that, that goes into the making of the movie, from the strands of hair on Maui's head to the closing number of the film. Um, but, but he always sort of lets the artistry lead, and that's, that's really vital. What, what goes into... I understand what actors do. I understand what producers do, writers. How do you write a song? I mean, that seems to me like the most difficult thing in the world to be inspired and come up with a song. Well, that's the hall pass that gets me into the room. Um, you know, that's for me. That's the um, that's the best part of the process. You know, it's you know, Leonard Cohen passed away yesterday, and he actually has my favorite quote on songwriting. He says. Uh, being a songwriter is like being a nun, you're married to a mystery. Um, and uh, for me, the simplest way to describe the process is you do tons of research um, to get the details right, but it's really nothing but putting yourself in the shoes of your character, um, feeling what they're going through in the moment you're writing, um, and talking to yourself until it feels true just trying the moment on and, and, and meeting the moment. Um, and and that's, that's what you do over and over again until it starts to uh, tell you what it sounds like. It, you start with a pulse, you start with the rhythm of the thing. Um, you, you break down the components of what this person is feeling in the best way um, to, to, to amplify that in song. A couple of the ones that, that you wrote how far I'll go is sort of the the theme of the heroine of the of the the uh, tell, almost every movie that, that's a musical has uh, a, a, a journey song right some some what do they want and and you've got how far I'll go tell us about that one yeah um, the only challenge about that is Disney's got such an incredible record of writing really good I want songs that uh, it's it's hard not to be intimidated. By it, um, you know, we were in the, the immediate wake of uh, the success of Frozen, which is an incredible score with incredible songs. So, you know, there's a part of my brain that's at the piano going, "Don't think about let it go. Don't think about let it go. Don't think about let it go." <laughs> hmm. um, at the same time, the answer to your problems is digging deep and digging deep and and really becoming the character uh, and and finding that specificity. For me, uh, my way into Moana was um, the thing that I related to uh, with her the most was this is someone who has a great life and has a family that she loves and an island that she loves and yet, and yet there's still this voice inside that says, I'm not supposed to be over here, I'm supposed to be out there. And um, you know, I'm a kid who grew up making stuff. I didn't know what I wanted to make. I wanted to draw animated cartoons. I wanted to be a filmmaker. I wanted to write songs. Um, but I knew I was gonna have a creative life. And I knew that's how I wanted to spend my days. Um, and that's not very practical, or at least the world will tell you that's not very practical. Um, and so, you know, I, a Puerto Rican kid growing up at the top of Manhattan, uh, and I, I remember being Moana's age and thinking, what is the distance between me and that, that thing that I want, that, that, that life spent creating things? Um, and that, that was my way in. And, and, uh, and so um, that's, that's how I got to how far I'll go. And you're welcome. That's to me in the vein of a friend like me or Hakuna Matata, just a fun song, but it explains an entire character. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the joy of, of getting someone like Dwayne The Rock Johnson to play a role is you can go so much larger than life. Um, he's literally playing a demigod. A demigod who, um, if you go to different islands within the Pacific Islands, you'll hear different stories. In some traditions, he's this sort of trickster god. He's sort of a Bugs Bunny. In some, he is this powerful, vengeful demigod. And so we, we sort of took the... You know, we took a little bit um, from lots of different traditions at, to create our version of Maui. Uh, and so uh, The Rock's probably the only person you can give the lyric you're welcome to and still be charmed by it. Uh, and so that was enormous fun to write, knowing that I had someone who could pull it off uh, and also getting to sneak in all these fun little creation myths. 
I didn't know he could sing, first of all, but I, I certainly, I mean, he, he has a lot of words in a short period of time to get out uh, when, when you get to the sort of the rap section. Uh, it's, 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 it's peanuts compared to Robert Preston and the Music Man, or David Diggs and Hamilton for that matter. Um, but it's, it, it's really fun to write sort of that kind of light pattern. You get to squeeze in all of these stories. And, um, and, and he, he was effortless with it. I mean, he really, he went home and did his homework. He trained for this song the way he trains uh, for, for his action roles. And so uh, I was grateful for that because he came in ready to play. So he impressed even you. Oh, yeah. You mentioned uh, Let It Go, uh, Robert Lopez, last person to join the EGOT group. You're right on the cusp. You've got the Emmy, you've got the <laughs> Grammys, you've got the Tonys. And he's right now the youngest, but you would be the youngest if you were to win, say, this coming February. He was like 39, and you're 36? I'm 36, yeah. I'm, uh, Bobby Lopez and I went to high school together. Oh, uh, wow. We went to the same elementary school together. His little brother was in my first musical in high school. Um, and so he's been a mentor and role model to me my whole life. Um, you know, I... I remember re-meeting him as an adult when I just graduated college and he was in previews with Avenue Q. Um, I ended up working with the same producers on In the Heights that he did for Avenue Q. Um, then he had an extraordinary success with the Book of Mormon and then uh, as Hamilton was happening, the, the Frozen phenomenon uh, was, was, was starting to happen. Um, so, and you couldn't meet a sweeter person in your life. He and Kristen have both been such sort of mentors like, come here <laughs> it's gonna be okay at so many various times in my in my life and career so um to even get to be in the same sentence as that dude is is, is an honor for me because uh he, he's a role model i mean that same sentence has richard rogers and marvin hamlish talking about composers i mean it's i'm sure you've seen the, who the group is of 12 i mean yeah. it's, it's an amazing group of people but, but totally different from each other. Right. Uh, even like uh, Rita Moreno, who you honored uh, at the Kennedy yeah. Center uh, a couple of years a, ago. Is, is a superhero of, of everyone in the Latino community. Um, you know, uh, and then there are great works of art that won nothing. And Vincent Van Gogh died penniless. And like, so, you know, awards are not a marker of excellence. I mean, but they're really cool. They're cool and Tony spin, um, so they have an extra component for your kids. Uh, but the, but you know, you can't think that way when you're making the thing. You know, the only thing you can control is making the best work of art you can, and then the world connects with it as it does or doesn't. And so that's that's what I focus on. Tony Awards uh, last summer. That was a tough day for everybody. Yeah, and the worst you give history. really the speech of the night, the speech of the year. When did it come to you? Was it just just when you got up those steps? I mean, how, how did you come up with that? No, I I had a little, you know, it was uh, I didn't hear about the the shooting until a little later than everyone else. I woke up at seven a.m. and we had a ton of stuff to do in the Tonys. We performed at various points in the evening. Um, there was a lot of just work to do. We had to rehearse our musical number we had these other little random cameos throughout. So I didn't hear the news until one o'clock. And then I had, I'd sort of built in a little time in the afternoon, a couple of hours, um, just to think about, all right, if I'm lucky enough to win and get up on stage, what am I going to say? Um, and then, you know, the worst shooting tragedy in our nation's history happened. And so that was very heavy on my heart and heavy on my mind. And in, in a, a weird way, it's... Um, it's the same thing I, I do when I write songs. This moment has it's presented itself, but it's not fictional, it's real. Um, how are you going to meet this moment? What are you going to meet it with? Um, and you know, I would have loved nothing better on any other day to thank the countless people, the cast and crew whose um, work made Hamilton possible um, but we also have this thing we have to contend with. We have this tragedy in all our hearts. So I also have to speak, I have a responsibility to speak to that. Um, and so I just did my best to meet the moment and I wrote what I wrote and said what I said. You had to feel like you were going to win that night though, right? I, I liked our chances. Um, you know, we, we had the, an insane number of nominations and, uh, uh, you know, competing with ourselves in several categories, in the acting categories. And so um, I knew that, you know, I knew we'd have success that night, and um, but I also had the liberty of knowing that the Hamilton um, experience had 
we didn't need to win anything. We could have gone home empty-handed and Hamilton would still be running um, because um, what that show has is the hardest thing to get, which is people leave our show for better or for worse and then tell their friends they have to see the show. Um, and that's the thing you're always chasing. Um, and so um, I felt very lucky about that. And so it was, um, you know, that was, that's how I sort of went into the day. You, um, oh, Hamilton, where does it go from here? I mean, I know it's going to be uh, in different other cities, and I'm sure eventually a tour, a movie. Yeah. Am I talking to you about a movie? Um, people are trying to talk to me about a movie, and I'm saying I can't talk to you about a movie. Uh, you know, I think, you know, this sounds crazy to say, especially because I'm such a movie buff, um, but I think translating musical stage pieces to the screen is about the toughest needle you can thread in this business. It's a real deft art of translation requires to get it right. Um, I can count on my hands the number of ones that are, are top to bottom successful. Uh, I think of Chicago. Uh, I, I love Sweeney Todd. I thought Sweeney Todd was imagined to a great horror film. Um, you know, uh, Cabaret. Uh, there's not a ton of them. And um, I've spent six years writing the best stage show possible. So I very selfishly want as many people to see it in that form uh, as I can before um, they see a, a version of the film's production, before they see uh, a feature adaptation. I want you to see the thing in the form for which it was intended first. And that's why we're working so hard to get as many productions out as we can. We'll have the Chicago, Chicago is up and running and it's amazing. Um, the next production opens in San Francisco and we'll be in LA in August uh, of next year. Um, we'll have London production next fall and uh, we're, we're working as, as fast as we can to get as many people in the room uh, contending with the show. Um, and, you know, I, I hope uh, down the line someone has a real vision on how to adapt it uh, successfully to the screen because, you know, a good movie musical, uh, we always need one of those. Uh, but I think it's a, a ways down the road. I know it'll be years before your next production, but I, I have this, this dream of, of uh, you know, anthologies have taken off on TV where different whole different thing the next year but the same cast members figure out a way to get all of those people back together again and do a whole new musical yeah oh well yeah i mean yeah maybe of course their 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 fees are now going up <laughs> yeah um you know it's it's lightning in a bottle to get the kind of uh company we had uh for hamilton and and yet um what's really wonderful is is seeing new productions and finding new actors who have the skill set and uh, make it their own you know uh Karen Olivo is playing Angelica in Chicago. Uh, she couldn't be more different than Renee Elise Goldsberry, but her Angelica is every bit as thrilling. Um, and so it's it's wonderful to watch. Um, you know, if if, if the, the, the the cliche is that your your art are your kids, you know, my kid is super college age. <laughs> like mm -hmm. my kid is going to be okay. And now the the show is written, and now I get to be the grandparent. Like I get to go and cheer and go, oh my gosh, you're all so young and talented and wonderful. Um, and 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 cheer for the show uh, in all its forms. And so I'm, I, I'm enjoying that role. One last question. Another dream of yours came true last month with hosting SNL. <laughs> Just uh, now that you've had a few weeks to reflect, what, what was what was it like? What was the highlight? What a dream come true that was. I, um, I'm that kid who taped it every night and watched it the next morning because I couldn't stay up late enough to watch it. Um, I read um, that great oral history. I read the revised version of the oral history when that came out. Um, so I just dug in. I just, you know, canceled everything else in my life. I stayed up till 4 a.m. with the writers on Tuesday night. Um, I just wanted as much of the experience as possible. I didn't want to just be the kind of host that just shows up for his sketches and says, all right, what do you have for me? Um, I was in there with him and uh, it was so much fun. Um, and then, you know, we, you know, I, I think we wrote that monologue from scratch the night before on Friday. Uh, we had a totally different thing planned. And uh, the excitement of that, of like, oh, we're nowhere and it's Friday night and I'm going to be on TV tomorrow night. Um, that whole uh, experience was also thrilling. Um, so, you know, it really, you know, I think at the end of the show, I said, this was the best week of my life. I'm not exaggerating. It was a real dream come true. You know, we do lots of polls and quizzes and predictions and all on our side. And at the end of... 
October, I did a poll, who was the best SNL host? To put, the, put the four of you in there. No, you won. Yeah, well, that's crazy. You doubled his numbers. Yeah, well, that's insane. They're wrong. I'm sorry. Sometimes sometimes the people, the will of the people can be incorrect. And in this case, Tom Hanks wins. I was actually at the taping that night, uh, and it was one of the most thrilling nights I had ever seen. I had the good fortune of... Um, Dave Chappelle was sitting next to me, and he was like, I'm thinking of hosting. He's going to host on Saturday. Mm -hmm. And I got to know that news ahead of everybody else. Um, and, um, you know, he he is one of the most successful hosts for a very good reason. In an alternate timeline, he's a regular cast member of that show, right? I think of, even besides this past few uh, weeks' performance, Mr. Short-Term Memory is one of my favorite SNL sketches. Tony Randall, you're Tony Randall. Um, so you know, it was it was a thrill to see to see him do that. Well, congrats on just such a wonderful year. Thank you so much.